Uh, good morning Beachside, it's Rob Davey here, I'm one of the uh, elders at Beachside. I'm just uh, continuing in what we are, I think, our last of our three-part um, unpacking of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, at the moment we are marching through the, the book of Acts and we have stopped just momentarily on a few verses at the beginning there where Jesus talks about uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So uh, it's an important topic so we thought it warranted pausing and, and next week we'll be powering on into, into chapter 2. Um, just a little bit of the story so far, very, very quickly, we talked about Jesus coming. He was a man on a mission, and then when he left, he left us with a mission, the, the Great Commission, which is at the end of each of the Gospels. And he told us at, at the end of Luke, he said, wait in Jerusalem, he said this to the disciples, wait until you are clothed with power on high. And so the particular verses which we've been looking at, and I'm going to read them out again now, are from Acts chapter 1. It's verses 4 to 5 and also verse 8. It says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then down in verse 8, he goes on to say, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, this baptism of the Holy Spirit is something different to the indwelling or the sealing of the Holy Spirit, which happens to uh, a believer at conversion when they first put their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, you might remember we use this example here of uh, this is a bucket. Uh, we might say this is the Holy Spirit or the bucket of the Spirit, and, and this is us, and we are baptized into uh, the Spirit. And so, um, same Spirit, here we go, in there, and it says in Ephesians 1 that we're sealed uh, with the Holy Spirit. But then Jesus talked about being baptized, and baptized was to, to dunk, to emerge, to be uh, submerged, to be overwhelmed by by the Holy Spirit. And so uh, we spoke last week, there, there can be some contention with some people about the timing of that. Some would say um, we're baptized in the Spirit and then it's this secondary experience where we're, we're filled, we're immersed in the Holy Spirit and that's quite a different same Spirit, but that one there, this bunch here is loaded, it's overwhelmed, it's filled with the Spirit. Um, and then some people would say it's not a secondary thing. They believe it's that when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, they're sealed with the Spirit and they're filled at conversion. It really doesn't matter in many respects what your personal probably view of that is. I think, I mean, we could debate that, but the most important thing is that both, we see both in the book of Acts, and we see it in chapter 8, we see it in chapter 19. What is the most important thing? The big takeaway is that we seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then not just be a, a, a one-off, but it be something that we continually desire and that we continually seek after. This was what uh, Paul Im implored the church in Ephesus to do, to be continually filled with the Spirit. It was this present, continuous verb. That's something we go back to often. We see it in the book of Acts, even between Acts chapter 2 and the day of Pentecost and Acts chapter 4. The same people were filled with the Holy Spirit again. So it's not necessarily a once-off experience. It's something we go back to again and again. You know, the Spirit leaks in some respects, and we come back and we want to be re-emerged, to be re-baptized, to be filled afresh and to be filled anew. So that is our, our big prayer, is that Beachsiders would... It, it's incorporated even into our, our, our vision statement to be a people who are so filled with God's powerful Holy Spirit that we see you know, transformation within us, within Palm Beach and other communities around the world. So um, let's not get too hung up on timing, but let's just be seeking that and desiring that. Um, the other thing we talked about more last week was the why. Why do we seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And this is an important thing and it's a helpful thing for us to to work out, I guess, when we spot something that's maybe not of God or something that may be a counterfeit. Now, it's very clear in, in Jesus' words, even here at the start of Acts, it's so that we, so that the disciples and so that us who continue with this mission can be Jesus' witnesses, that we can be witnesses to this gospel of truth, that we would be able to proclaim it with boldness and take it out into the world. I love the way uh, John Piper describes it. It's, it's uh, extraordinary power for Christ exalting ministry. And so this is the, the purpose and the mission of the Holy Spirit um, within us. Um, it also says in John 16, where, where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, he says, it will bring glory to me. So one of the whys of the Holy Spirit and the infilling, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that we would give glory to Jesus. And 
Uh, if ever we are in doubt or if ever we want to, um, I guess, query something and wonder, well, is, is that the fullness of the Holy Spirit? We have a wonderful example, not only in obviously reading the book of Acts, and uh, but also the most obvious example is Jesus himself, who was a man who was perfectly filled with the Holy Spirit, led, guided, and ordained by the Holy Spirit in his entire ministry. And so um, we look to Jesus as an example of that. So all of this is by way of background, so that as we, um, I'm not going to be able to go into every uh, scripture which talks about the fullness of the Holy Spirit, but this, this foundational talk, I suppose, or talks, is so that as we read on through the, the, the book of Acts and as we're inspired, by that and challenged by that that we would see um, yeah we would see this at work and that we would be looking to see it more in our own lives so one of the things I mentioned last week I'm just gonna dry my hands because a lot of spirit on it um, one of the things we spoke about last week was talking about the how and also the what so we spoke very briefly about how we are filled with the Holy Spirit and I'm going to finish by expanding on that a little bit uh, today uh, but I want to talk about what is the, the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So uh, the language which is used in the Bible, but particularly in Acts, you'll see words like baptism in the Holy Spirit, baptism with the Holy Spirit, but we also see receiving of the Holy Spirit, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit coming upon somebody or falling upon somebody, uh, somebody receiving power. Jesus uses the language of power uh, both at the end of Luke and at the start of, of, of Acts. So what does this mean? So sometimes I think it's helpful to use a couple of analogies. And, and so um, one example which I think is helpful for me is when we sort of think about how we can sort of be in the spirit um, but be difference being baptized in it is think about our actual bodies like the constitution of, of who we are we have the uh, our actual bodies ourselves our, our physical nature um, we have our, our soul which is I guess our mind our, our will um, you know our intellect and then we also have the spirit and so the Bible says that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ we receive the Holy Spirit we're sealed by the Spirit says that in Ephesians 1 uh, in Romans 8 um, it's Paul says that that if you don't have the spirit that the spirit of Christ is not in you then you you have no part in Christ that's in uh, Romans 8 and so um, we become so accustomed we can have the spirit in our lives but we can become so accustomed to living out of those other two natures out of the body out of the soul uh, which we would probably characterize together as being as being the flesh and so we're guided and we're driven by our, our thoughts or our feelings, our desires, and also the demands, for example, of our, our body. Um, and so the spirit can be present, it can be in us, but it's not the dominant voice. It's not the one that's driving us, compelling us, moving us in any particular direction. It's like a, you can think of it as being like a car where the, you know, the spirit in, uh, is in the back seat and it's full of capacity, it's full of gifts, it's full of power, but it's sitting in the back seat kind of dormant. Uh, but then you have the, the mind and you have the soul and you have the body and they're the ones driving the car, they're the ones um, screaming in direction. And um, I find that I'm most, uh, 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 what's the word, um, aware of that, I suppose. Like if anyone's ever fasted, for example, when you uh, are fasting and you start getting hungry and those times of the day where the body is just, you don't realize it because most of the time we just get hungry, we eat, we're thirsty, we drink, we just go and satisfy the needs of our, our flesh all the time. Um, but then when you're fasting, all of a sudden that body starts to get a bit angry, it starts to get hangry, it starts to rise up and you start to be really, really aware that, man, the voice of my of my body telling me it's hungry, Rob, this is the time when we eat, we need to get a feed. And um, it's an interesting thing for me, I'm like, wow, I just don't realize sometimes how much my thoughts, my movements, my actions are driven by these other two aspects of ourselves. And so one way to think of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is those two being overwhelmed, being overpowered, being drenched, that the Spirit of God rises up within us and it overwhelms those other aspects. So the most dominant voice, the most dominant driver within us actually becomes the pure, holy, wonderful uh, Spirit of God rather than the, than the flesh that which we hold. So um, that can be a helpful way to think about it, uh, that new life and power will pour out from our spirit and will baptize our soul and our body and from there it will go out into the world around us. Um, one thing which I would say, uh, well it's actually four things I would say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is that it is noticeable, that it is powerful, 
that it is conscious and it is experienced okay it is noticeable it is powerful it is conscious and it is experienced you can't read the book of acts and look at the experience of the disciples and the first christians being filled with the holy spirit and, and conclude that this is purely something that's doctrinal or based in reason it was something that was profoundly experienced by these guys and something that was noticeable uh, paul describes it in romans 5 5 as the love of god being poured being poured into our hearts through uh, the holy spirit um, uh, the, the king james i love the way he puts it the love of God is shed abroad in our heart through the Holy Ghost um, which is given unto us so it's a tremendous experience it's an experience people are moved they are lost in a sense of wonder of prayer and, and of love uh, Peter describes it in, in, uh, in Peter uh, 1 8 as, as joy unspeakable that that flows out Jesus calls it rivers of living water this is not a purely intellectual experience if you look at Acts 2 um, uh, also the whole book of Acts and you'll see that there was physical manifestations of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit the disciples and first apostles were able to meet Christians and they would know upon meeting them whether they were, had received the Holy Spirit and they were full of the Holy Spirit. So um, let's not be tempted to make it into an intellectual exercise, but rather something which we, which we do seek to experience. The New Testament church was full of joy and power, of life and of abandon and of thrill and of, and of boldness. Um, you know, even the word uh, for, for, for power that Jesus uses is, is dunamis. I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago that dunamis is the word where we get dynamite from. There's never any doubt where dynamite has been. If dynamite's blown up, there is a crater, there is something destroyed, there is a, there is a profound change in the environment where there has been dynamite. And this is the kind of dunamis, this is the power that Jesus speaks about which accompanies the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So. These blessings, this characterized the New Testament church. We read about it in Acts. It's characterized the church ever since then as we look through our periods of revival and reformation. These outpourings of the Holy Spirit have been noticeable, powerful, conscious, and experienced. And so that's not, that's not intended to make anybody feel like they've missed out, but to remind us and to tell us that this is something that we, that we should eagerly seek. In fact, it's um, kind of crazy to think that we could be filled with God's powerful Holy Spirit and not think that it has a major transformative effect on our lives to be filled with God's Spirit and you could just be normal that everything would just be the same that you would see the world and everything would be it's it's impossible to think that would even even be the case so um, so if you are unsure if you've ever been filled with the Holy Spirit if you've been unsure if you've ever had the rivers of living water flow out of you that you've ever been overwhelmed as it talks about being baptized to be overwhelmed by the spirit to have uh, uh, as John Piper calls it that that extraordinary power for Christ exalting ministry in inside of you to have the love of God shed abroad in your heart if you're like I don't I don't know if I've experienced that or not well I, I would probably say it's, it's it's probably akin to skydiving you know um, I don't think too many people would say oh, I'm not sure if I've skydived before you know um, I may have done it I I think if you jumped out of a plane at 10,000 feet, you know, and gone, you would remember that. That would be an experience that you would remember. And so I would say, if you're not sure whether you feel experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then I think that's probably a good case to say, no, maybe I haven't experienced that. But that's fine. Jesus tells us to ask for it, to seek it, to that this is a fine thing to to go after. So. This is one of the risks, I suppose, of, of solely believing that that baptism of the Holy Spirit is something which is experienced maybe or just once at conversion. We run the risk of not wanting it, not seeking it, and not believing that it's something for, for us today. So um, one thing that which is important, I think, to clarify when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit being an experience, um, I think one misnomer is that it's not uh, necessarily speaking in tongues. Like there would be some people that would 
would preach or speak that that the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is speaking in another tongue. Um, it is an evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, but it definitely isn't the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I, I think the far greater evidence that we see of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts is that people's hearts are set on fire for Jesus in his mission, that they're, that they're swept up and they're captivated by, by being a witness for Jesus in boldness. So um, tongues isn't even uh, described in the Bible as being the most important gift, but it is mentioned and is certainly often focused upon because it is commonly one of the first gifts of the Spirit that are experienced, one of the first manifestations of the Spirit which is experienced by many people. But if you're not someone who speaks in tongues or is that something you've ever experienced it doesn't mean you're not a Christian and doesn't even mean you're not filled with the Holy Spirit um, you know I, I think the most obvious example of that truth is the fact that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and he moved in the power of the Holy Spirit and there's no evidence in the Gospels that Jesus ever spoke in tongues so tongues is not a bad thing it's a wonderful thing and I, I expect that as we go through this book of Acts we'll unpack it a little bit more but don't get hung up on going well that's the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit there can be an evidence but it's certainly not the evidence um, one other point I think is just worth clarifying is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not something that is received by faith this is not something you just claim it by faith and say okay I haven't had any experience but I believe it I'm standing firm that in faith I, I have that um, no, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not something received by faith. It is a deep and profound experience of God and God's love in your heart. We cannot, pardon me, we cannot take it by faith because it's entirely given. It's a gift. It's given to us. So we can only wait for it by faith. We can only read these scriptures like Luke 11 and say, well, you say that if we ask, that if we seek, that we knock, that you're a good father, that you give good gifts. And so we stand in faith on those promises and on those scriptures, but we, I don't think we stand in faith and say, I, I have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No, what we are able to do is we are able to wait. We are able to certainly desire it and we're certainly able to receive it. But, uh, but we wait for God and His perfect timing to, to pour that out into our hearts. Um, and one other point I think about the experience is to say, uh, just because it is experience, I don't think we should just seek an experience. What we seek is Jesus, who the Spirit reveals and who the Spirit glorifies, and we bear witness to Jesus and His wonderful gospel. Um, and then the experience follows that. Um, there's a cool quote by, by Martin Lloyd-Jones. He wrote an excellent book, um, Joy Unspeakable, talking about that, the Holy Spirit. He says this, Let us together decide to beseech Him, to plead with Him to do this again, not that we may have the experience or the excitement, but that His mighty hand may be known and His great name may be glorified and magnified among the people. This pouring out of God's love into our hearts, as, as Paul says in, in, in Romans 5, is often described or experienced as, a, as an affirmation of our salvation, as an affirmation of God's love for us. Many people experience this profound sense of God's love and acceptance and this makes perfect sense in Romans 8 it says that his spirit testifies with our spirit that we are um, that we are children of God that spirit that cries out Abba Father and this is not a bad thing it's not a bad thing to desire that that affirming assurance of salvation um, as we look through uh, many of the gospel preachers of old the likes of Charles Spurgeon and George Whitfield and Dwight L Moody and Arthur Pierce and A.J. Gordon, all of these guys share their experiences of wrestling, of contending, of desiring and seeking that deep assurance of salvation in Christ. And their respective experiences of that were all overwhelming in their glory. If you want to read their stories, and it's, 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 it's very cool. Um, yeah, Moody quite famously prayed that when he was filled with the Spirit that God would hold back his hand that it was, it was too much for him to, to contain and contend with. So, um, yeah, so seeking assurance of God's salvation. And that, and that, that sense of God's love in our, our hearts, that emboldens us, it equips us um, for ministry. An overwhelming assurance of God's love for us enables us to boldly witness for Christ uh, to, a, to an unbelieving world. I, I really... Um, in the Alpha video series, I remember Nikki Gumbel says that he says the Holy Spirit he says is just synonymous with love. That um, the experience in God's love is how he how he views the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
In Mark 12, 30, Jesus said, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. But how can we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength unless we first have an appreciation and experience of His first love for us and that strong sense of His love, of His affirmation, His assurance of our salvation is, is one of the hallmarks of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So to finish, um, we want to talk more about the how. How do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? I, I mentioned last week, um, Jesus provides the clearest um, direction on this, like obviously with the disciples uh, before, before Pentecost, he told them to wait. Um, back in Luke 11, um, I won't read the whole passage, I'll just focus on 5 to 13 is where Jesus talks about this, but the key verses are verse 9 to 11. So this is Luke 11, 9 to 11. He says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so these are these key words that Jesus said, he's ask, seek, knock. And just like that word of being filled with the Holy Spirit as a present continuous verb, these words are exactly the same. The example that Jesus gives of, of a neighbor knocking on the door, of being persistent, of, of being almost rude and, 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 and forward, and he's encouraging us to, to come and ask it, that it's fine to desire it, to seek it. You know, he says, if you, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those will be, those will be filled. So wrestle like Jacob did. Um, you know, with, with the angel and wanting the blessing. Um, petition heaven relentlessly, beg, supplicate. He's telling us that it's fine to come and ask for this, this thing. And make your desire known to God. I think it's fine to come to God and say, I, 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 I want to know this, I want to understand this, I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit, I want to experience the fullness of you. And, and God will give it at his appointed season. Um, we cannot make God come in power in our life. We cannot force his hand, okay? We can certainly ask. But the other thing I think we can do is that we can constrain him. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, I think there are things we can do to, um, I guess, quench the Spirit and stop the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so I've got three little tips here for us which I hope might be helpful and I'll use a couple of analogies which might help them get some stickability with us. So one of the things which I think will immediately um, make the infilling of the Holy Spirit uh, more difficult is if we just don't believe it's for us. If we just don't believe it's something we can experience, it's something we can believe, we can ask for, if we don't realise the possibility. So you, if you don't ask for something you more than likely won't receive it. Um, but uh, in saying that, I would point out that Paul, in the example of him on the road to, to Damascus, you know, he, he, was, he was hostile to God. He was pursuing Christians. He was trying to destroy this, this new faith. And, and Jesus encountered him in a, in a profound and powerful way on the road to Damascus. And he was, went and got prayed for by Ananias and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So, you know, God, there is definitely precedent for Jesus intervening even with someone that is hostile to the, to the Holy Spirit. So that's uh, not impossible, but certainly if we're not asking for it, we don't believe it's for us, we don't believe it's for today, then you'd have to think that's going to hinder our likelihood of receiving it. Uh, and related to that, I think, is the issue of fear. But we might say, okay, well, I do believe it and I can see this stuff in Acts 2, but I'm just kind of afraid, like this idea of the the Spirit of God overwhelming me and rising up inside of me and, 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 and changing me and physical manifestations and things happening. It just sounds a little too out there. It's a little bit outside my comfort zone. And I think that's why Jesus uses that, um, that example in Luke 11. He says, he, he reiterates, he says, the Father is a good Father. He's a good Father. And if you who are evil know how to good give good gifts, how much more will a good father give good gifts? I think what he's saying is, you don't need to be afraid or fearful of asking this. What, 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 what father, if you ask for a, you know, an egg, is going to give a scorpion? He says, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, it's going to be a great gift. So if you are fearful of being filled with the Holy Spirit, I think Jesus is saying to us, don't, don't stress too much. This is a wonderful gift. Um, I know when I have prayed, the second thing that I would point out, which I know has 
I think can hinder the infilling of the Holy Spirit is just simply the idea of space. I know in the past, and I've been praying, saying, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I have felt this still voice say to me, well, I need room. He needs room. And if we sort of think about it again as being like a, again, like the sponge, that if the sponge is already filled with other things, and in this case, you know, when you, when I drop that in there, that's full of air. And so it doesn't immediately get filled with spirit. In fact, we squeeze the air out of it in order for it to be filled up with the Holy Spirit. And we can be a little bit like that, that um, maybe we're full of our own desires, we're full of our own selfish ambition, we're full of our own um, things that we want to do and the way we want to lead our lives and, and different things that are maybe contrary to God. And what he says is to be, or I, I, I think we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we empty of ourselves. Our prayer is that, God, we want more of you. Fill me. Um, drive out anything that's in me that's not of you. Transform me. Make me more like you. To be to be like Paul, how he prayed in Philippians 3, that I want to know Christ I want to, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, that it's in pursuit of God. It's like, again, if we, we think about the the constitution of the human of the mind and the soul and the body um, you might think of it as being like a house it's like well we've got this room here where i'm happy to have the holy spirit in that and it can dictate affairs on sunday and this different thing but what about the, these other rooms of my house or no he doesn't have any say on this or he doesn't have any say on my finance he doesn't have any say on my hobbies he doesn't have any say on my time or my work whatever it might be and i think when we when we say fill me with your holy spirit we're saying take every room of the house, overwhelm all of them, baptize all of them, spread yourself out, take take complete tr control, have complete say. And so our holiness and, and our desire for God and um, you know, I think even the lives that we live can be important in that regard. Um, I've heard it once said that our obedience is a marker of our desire. Um, Jesus says, if you love me, what's his love language? He says, if you love me, he says, this is John 14, you will keep my commands. But what does the very verse, next verse say? And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate, the Holy Spirit, to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. So we obey him not because we want something, but because we love him, because we want to know him, because we want to be full of him. So that's why we put to death the misdeeds of the body, like it says in, in Romans 8, that we would be emptied of the things which, which are not of God so that he can fill us and overwhelm us. And I know when I pray, I have that, that is a part of my prayer, is say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit, but, but just enlighten those things to me which are not of you and push those out of me. Um, and the third thing that I would say very simply uh, and lastly is, is just to be aligning ourselves with his mission and purpose. Um, we talked about the why of the Holy Spirit is so that we would be his witnesses. And so I think when we pray to be filled with maybe from the wrong space or the wrong motives, I think we're at cross purposes of what God is trying to do. Uh, you, we see this and we'll probably talk about it later in the in Acts chapter 8 where Simon the sorcerer, he's seen these these miracles. He's seen signs of wonders being performed by the, by the disciples, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he wants it, but he wants it for the wrong reasons and the wrong motives. And you see that that um, Peter really heavily rebukes him. Um, I was um, you know, praying on the beach the other day and was thinking about this and I went for a walk with, with Val and we were, um, it was quite a strong wind and when we were walking north the wind was behind us and it was, we hadn't really noticed how strong it was but then when we turned around and, and walked back and we were heading south, it was this very strong wind blowing into um, you know, our faces and it was like, oh, that's a bit colder, it's a bit harder to do and, and it's a little bit like that. The Holy Spirit is described as a wind, that, that Raul, the same word in Hebrew for wind, is the same word for, for breath, and it's the same word for the Holy Spirit. Um, and a useful analogy, I think, is to think of it as a little bit like a boat, and not just a small boat, but one of those boats with lots of masts and lots of sails. And, and we ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to have this wind fill all of our sails. But if we're not in alignment with his mission and purpose, it's, it's a little bit like facing into the wind and trying to put your sails up and saying, fill these. And it's like, well, that's, that's never going to work. 
It's only when you spin and put yourself in the direction of the wind and you hoist those sails up that the wind will be able to fill those sails and capture those sails and, and push and drive and move the vessel on forward. And so that's another thing that I would I would encourage us to be doing as we pray, to be as we ask, as we seek, as we knock, and say, Lord, bring me into alignment with what your spirit is doing. So as I pray and then as I experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit in my life, it, it my, I, I'm capturing and I'm moving in the direction that you're moving it. And if I'm if I'm at cross purposes or at poor motives and I'm facing the wrong way and I'm facing into the wind of the Spirit, I'm trying to capture it, um, help me to see the futility of that and, and make the adjustment that's required. Okay? That's all we have time for. I've probably gone over time, but that's it for the how. We ask, we seek, we knock, we put ourselves into alignment with Him. Uh, we make space within ourselves. If we can be filled, uh, we need to be empty of the things which would, which would um, make it difficult or obstructive for the Holy Spirit to fill us. And we have to believe it's even possible. We, we, we have not because we ask not, and we might not ask if we don't believe it's for now and today. So as an application point for us beachsiders, I hope, that as we power on through the book of Acts, that you be looking, that you be examining, that you be inspired by what you see the early church doing and realizing this is something for today, that this is something that the mission back then is the same as the mission today. The Holy Spirit back then is the same as the Holy Spirit today. And, and I hope that with myself and with others, we'll join together in praying and seeking God and knocking on heaven's door and asking to be filled afresh, to experience the fullness of the Spirit in his life, to be have that extraordinary power for Christ uh, exalting ministry to have that sense of assurance of salvation of his love in our lives that would flow out of us that it would baptize our our mind our soul and our will and our emotions and it would overflow in, in boldness and gospel proclamation to, to those that are around us so let's be praying for that as we as we power on through this series amen God bless